tonight, the startling, sobering results of a 2020 investigation. Satanism, devil worship, is being practiced all across the country. We have all types of perversion going on, and it's affecting America. Perverse, hideous acts that defy belief. Suicides, murders, and the ritualistic slaughter of children and animals. Yet so far, police have been helpless. The problem that exists is we're getting the stories, but we, we don't have the victims. Our report comes after questions by 2020 viewers. Tom Gerald, with signs of and testimony about the devil worshippers. And Hugh Hefner and Peter Bogdanovich once seemed like good friends. Both work in fantasy worlds. Hefner chooses pinups. Bogdanovich makes movies. Now they are blaming each other for playmate Dorothy Stratton's death. It's a wild feud, fueled by ego and power. Geraldo Rivera with some surprising facts and the truth behind a case of smear and obsession. 2020 will continue in a moment. Up front tonight, a 2020 investigation. You know, the stories we air originate in many ways and for many reasons. Some ideas, as I'm sure you're aware, come through the mail from you, often involving issues of deep concern. And that's the case with our first story this evening. There have been a series of criminal acts reported around the country that have had unique characteristics that link them together. And the source of all this is the apparent practice of Satanism. That's worship of the devil. Now, police have been skeptical when investigating these acts, just as we are in reporting them. But there is no question that something is going on out there. And that's sufficient reason for 2020 to look into it. One caution. We believe that some of the pictures and descriptions in Tom Gerald's report may be disturbing, even frightening, particularly to younger viewers. Here is Tom's report. Dateline, North Fort Long Island. A quiet community rocked by reports a teenager was dragged through these woods toward a late-night ritual of death. An eyewitness said the victim, Gary Lowers, was forced to pray to Satan as he was repeatedly stabbed to death. Two young men were arrested. James Troyano was found innocent last month, but his alleged accomplice never made it to trial. Ricky Casso committed suicide in jail the day after his arrest. Despite numerous signs that Casso was into Satanism and rock music associated with devil worship, police steadfastly refused to label this case satanic. The official explanation, a drug-related crime. Dateline, Phoenix, Arizona, 140 dogs found slaughtered. Across the country, police tell us, there have been more than 15,000 animal mutilations, and often they were clearly used in some kind of bizarre ritual, but there's no official explanation. Dateline, Walnut Grove, Alabama. Police are called in to investigate the site of what appears to have been a ritual. They find various satanic paraphernalia, including pictures of the devil. There was a routine inquiry which didn't discover what was going on here. Across this country and Canada, satanic graffiti is turning up on public buildings and abandoned buildings where police suspect secret meetings are being held by people calling themselves Satanist, people who worship the devil. Most often found, the inverted five-pointed satanic pentagram, the upside-down cross, the evil eye, References to Babylon and the devil's number, 666. Vandals often target churches. Here in southern Maine, after a dozen churches were painted with satanic symbols, police arrested a suspect. Worry about the message. That's one comment. Although vandalism charges were later dropped, he offered an explanation for the church graffiti from behind a locked door. Anyone that receives the mark of the beast, which is 666, is his number, is going to burn in hell forever and ever. It's the way some people interpret the Bible. The book of Revelations, where it's written, Satan can be identified by the number 666, calling him the beast, which deceiveth the whole world. The goat's head is a key symbol of the beast. Yet throughout history, Satan has taken on many different shapes and disguises. He's widely considered by conventional religions as the embodiment of evil, on a mission to tempt man to sin and destroy God's kingdom. Today, we have found Satan is alive and thriving, or at least plenty of people believe he is. His followers are extremely secretive, but found in all walks of life. Modern Satanism was shockingly dramatized on the screen in the mid-60s with the release of Rosemary's Baby. What have you done to it? What have you done to its eyes? 
He has his father's eyes. It's a movie that's been described as the best advertisement that devil worship has ever had. What are you talking about, guys? I are normal. What have you done to him, you maniac? Satan is his father, not Guy. He came up from hell and begat a son of mortal woman. Hail, Satan! Hail, Satan! Satan is his father, and his name is Adrian. He shall overthrow the mighty in the temples. He shall redeem the despised and reap vengeance. The zeal of these fictional devil worshippers is strikingly similar to that of real-life Satanists. God is dead! Hey, Satan! Satan lives! See, these guys, they wouldn't leave him alone. Mike Warnke is a former Satanist. Today, he's a successful comedian, preaching Christianity in the form of humor. But back in the 60s, he was one of Satanism's high priests. Uh, the things that you would see in a satanic altar. He showed us what a satanic temple might resemble, and typical implements used to worship the devil. The bones usually are used in a ceremony that calls for uh, telling the future with the bones or a part of the deceased person. He also explained what attracted him to Satanism. I was basically drawn into it uh, when I was young, just wanting to be somebody special. I just wanted to to be different than everybody and have something that was special that everybody, you know, looked up to. This is a 15-year-old boy who also wanted to be special. Before hanging himself, he wrote on his body, I'm coming home, Master, and Satan lives, and 666. It was a case with such clear satanic symbols. It brought two police officers together. Sandy Gallant is one of them. She's a San Francisco policewoman and now a leading authority on satanic crime a specialty other cops often scoff at. As time goes on, maybe my work gets a little more credibility. Uh, there's one guy that still walks around, and when he sees me, he goes <laughs> like this wherever he goes. But I've gotten pretty much used to that. Why did you? The other officer is Dale Griffiths, chief of a small police department halfway across the country in Tiffin, Ohio. We have kids being killed. We have uh, people missing in America. We have our own MIAs right here. We have cattle being killed. We have all types of perversion going on, and it's affecting America. America is being affected. Nationwide, we found that minor cases of satanic activity light up the map. Not a single state is unaffected. But even more frightening is the number of reported murders and suicides with satanic clues. All of them were investigated by police, but usually without much result. We found that Satanism falls into three categories. One, self-style Satanist, a growing number of young people who dabble in devil worship. Two, religious Satanist, people who publicly worship the devil, a rite that's protected by law. And three, satanic cults, what appear to be highly secretive groups committing criminal acts, including murder. First, let's examine self-style Satanists like Ricky Casso. Often they're teenagers who learn that the message of Satanism is for sale right in the neighborhood. This shopping mall in affluent Westchester County, New York, exemplifies how easy it is for children, or adults for that matter, to get their hands on satanic material. We stress it's perfectly legal, and these are typical commercial outlets you'll find just about anywhere. Three stores side by side, a bookstore, a music store, a videotape center, each offering seemingly harmless types of entertainment, like movies. Here at the Neighborhood Videotape Store, take a look at the number of movies that involve Satanism. Most were popular films in their day, but even today, if one is inclined to believe in Satanism, it's a way to actually see the devil and perhaps be inspired. In The Exorcist, it is the tremendous power of the devil himself controlling a little girl's body against the will of a priest. It makes the movie still one of the most popular examples of evil versus good. By this time, the of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father. It wasn't that a demon jumped out of the TV and grabbed me by the face and drug me down the road and forced me to join the Church of Satan. It was just that there were certain things in this program that piqued my interest, and then I decided to study more on my own. And, and if, dev, if the devil has PR, then it is, you know, cinema. Then there's also the satanic literature, which includes many books that are sold in many bookstores. Librarians point out that they're among the most popular books on their shelves. Here, as in almost any bookstore, you'll find both the Satanic Bible and its companion, the Satanic Rituals, 
a step-by-step -step guide to performing evil rites. Kids get their ideas, especially their psychological uh, pumping up, so to speak, from the literature. And uh, books play an extremely important part. And finally, music, which is found here in the neighborhood record store under the category of heavy metal music. The satanic message is clear, both in the album covers and in the lyrics, which are reaching impressionable young minds. And the musical message comes across loud and clear at concerts and now through rock videos. The symbolism is all there. The satanic pentagram. The upside down cross. The blank eyes of the beast. The rebellion against Christianity. And again and again, the obsession with death. According to most groups, it's all done in fun. But according to police, it's having an effect on many children. A growing subculture that mixes heavy metal music with drugs and the occult. In addition to groups that are blatantly satanic, there are also many recordings which some believe may contain satanic references in the form of backward messages. What's a popular song that has a reference to the devil in it? Chris Edmonds is a Detroit disc uh, jockey Stairway to Heaven. whose specialty is finding Would secret recorded messages the, exhorting the, the devil the by playing music popular with kids in reverse, a technique they've learned to use. Okay, the phrase we're looking for is, uh, and there's still time to change the road you're on. Now flip it for us. Okay. A lot of people hear the phrase, my sweet Satan. Here, when they play this backwards. Can you hear it? My sweet Satan. How often do you find uh, heavy metal music uh, indicators at uh, the scene of a crime involving satanic worship? Probably about 35, 40% of the calls regularly then. Yes. This artwork is from a homicide case that combined heavy metal music with self-styled Satanism. It's the work of 18-year-old Scott Waterhouse, a so-called Satanist whose drawings clearly show he had murder on his mind. He's now serving a light prison term for the slaying of 12-year-old Giselle Cody. Before this case, officers here at the local police station in Sanford, Maine, had never even heard about satanic crimes. But that's all changed. The officer who broke the case was State Detective Mo Olette. When you reached the crime scene, what did you find? When I reached the crime scene, uh, the local police had caught in the area off, uh, showed me the bank and where the young lady was found. She was probably killed right there at that particular area. She was strangled. Waterhouse was seen leaving the crime scene. And in a deposition, when he was later questioned by Officer Olette, he seemed almost proud to boast, I'm a Satanist. Waterhouse also described how he first became involved in it. In a bookstore, my friend hit the shelf and a book fell out, and I caught it, and it had a pretty weird-looking guy on the back. The book was the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. After Scott Waterhouse's trial, both the prosecution and the victim's father claimed that although the Satanic Bible did not condone violence, Waterhouse had interpreted it that way. The book made you feel, do what you want to do, and the heck with everybody else, more or less. And I believe that that had a lot to do with it. It tries to make itself innocuous. But if you actually read it and believe it to the letter, it's a very dangerous manifesto. The author of the Satanic Bible, Anton LaVey, is a former lion tamer and palm reader, who in 1966 founded the First Church of Satan. It quickly became the country's most prominent satanic organization, fully protected as a religion under the law. This is a very selfish religion. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. This is based on what man naturally would do. The Church of Satan and other organized devil worship groups represent our second category, religious Satanist. Although LaVey would not talk to us, we can get a glimpse of his theories and his rituals in this 1970 documentary on his church. We feel a person should be free to indulge in all the so-called fetishes that they would desire, as long as they don't hurt anyone that doesn't deserve or wish to be hurt. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! We perform human sacrifices by proxy, you might say, the destruction of human beings who would, let's say, create an antagonistic situation towards us in the form of curses and hexes. 
not in actual blood rituals because certainly the destruction of a human being physically is illegal. Police we spoke to say they have never made a link between this satanic church and the satanic crimes being committed. However, some incidents described to us by witnesses from around the country are strikingly similar to these ritualistic scenes. For example, the ritualistic embracing of death, actually being placed inside a coffin containing a body. Lo, you are free to end it when you will. Or ritualistic sacrifice, using a voodoo-type doll to place a curse on an unsuspecting victim. It's nothing that can be called physically harmful or illegal. Oh, my Satan, destroy those who love God. Although not connected to the Church of Satan, these 12-year-old boys, with their parents' consent, demonstrated how they were taught to inflict pain on their enemies. They also claimed they witnessed sacrificial murder by members of our third category of Satanism, satanic cult. Police have found no proof, made no arrest. But that's no surprise. For nationwide, police are hearing strikingly similar horror stories, and not one has ever been proved. Take, for example, this case, the mother of a young victim who asked not to be identified. Usually they had the children kill the infants or the other kids. The children who were there actually right. were, what, were given knives? Yes, they were. And if they refused to do it, an adult, usually the child's father or mother would actually take the child's hand and make them kill the child. There's also this similar case that links child sex abuse with murder. The children were given, um, were given knives and told to go and stab those bodies. And um, my grandchildren told me that they couldn't do that, that it wasn't it wasn't possible that they could only get the knives to go in about that far and then the adults um, put their hands over the children's hands and shoved the knives in was there any reference to the devil yes yes and this case now under police investigation involving young boys describing murder tell me what you were asked to do i was asked to stab him to stab him and this was in front of the other people who were there uh, were you given a knife? Yes. And were you told what would happen to you if you didn't? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you remember what they said? This will happen to you. So you either stab him or you'll be stabbed was about what it came down to. When the oldest boy describes stabbing him with a knife, uh, what's his reaction? It's a hard, hard thing for him to say. He's been more apt to um, act it out. Do you remember his eyes? With their guardian's consent, the boys used a doll to illustrate what they did. You say you were given the knife, and then what did you do? Go like this. Did you push the knife all the way in deep, or did you just touch the skin? All the way in deep. In deep. Were you in the room where this was going on? Did you see what happened to the child that was stuck with the knife? Yeah. What do you remember? Oh, blood. Ritualistic murder has become a specialty for San Francisco's chief medical examiner. Are local investigators really prepared, equipped? Uh, do they know what to look for when investigating these cases? No, I don't think they do. Even though we're uh, many different people are trying to get out the message about ritualistic or funny types of killings, First of all, just on their face value, they sound so unusual or bizarre that most people hearing that message really don't think that it's true. It's bizarre and hard to prove. Yet the tales that were told to us in interviews conducted across the country were later verified by authorities who say there are consistent telltale clues. And they provide a checklist of six satanic practices to look for. For example, being placed inside a coffin. It's an experience that many children are describing. Well, the adults would dig up the caskets from the graveyards, and all the members, including the children, were made to lay in the remains of whatever was in the casket. Get in a casket with a decomposed body? Right, and then the casket was closed, and they would be lowered into the ground while they were in the casket. The author of a popular book on Satanism, Dr. Lawrence Pastor. Children are involved in graveyards and crematoria, in funeral parlors because one of the primary focuses of these people is death. Everything is attempted to be destroyed and killed in that child and in society, everything of goodness. And death is a major preoccupation.
Another indicator, satanic paraphernalia. In every case, the children talk about precisely the same setting. They described uh, a satanic goat's head being on the wall over the table. They described um, a lot of candles. Um, and they described people in black and white robes with hoods. The hood, Mike, what's this for? This is to create for whoever's practicing a, a magical atmosphere. The I colors mean anything? Yeah, the red ones would be used for some types of sexual rituals, people who are doing mm -hmm. sexual magic. Uh, this would be used for ordinary ceremonies and also for ceremonies where you'd be uh, throwing a curse on somebody. Another indicator, kidnapping. In almost every case, the children have talked about children who were snatched and later sacrificed. They were taught to aid in the kidnapping of children. What they would do is uh, the kids would go and play with the children and then tell them that they were either going to go to a party or that there was some toys or whatever and get them so they weren't on the move and then her father and other members would grab the kids. Do you find missing children sometimes fall prey to these people? I believe that they do. I can't, we can't prove that they do. but. As a law enforcement officer, I question two million children missing in the United States knowing that many, many of those are not runaways and are so young that they couldn't run away anyway. Number four, sexual abuse aimed at destroying faith in God. It's being described by numerous children. What were the parallels with what the boys have told you and uh, the worship of Satan? Well, first of all, the sexual abuse, the pornography, which always seems to, to go hand in hand. The boys talked about how these people actually said, I hate God, and they used a very deep voice when they talked about that. One of their primary aims is to, des to destroy the belief system within a child, to make a child turn against what they believe in in terms of who they are, of who God is, uh, and to desecrate all matter of flesh, all matter of church institution, all matter of sign and symbol that a child could in any way be attached to cannibalism it's difficult to believe but in every case we examined children described it the hearts were cut out and the, the children were made to chew pieces of these children's hearts pieces of their flesh <sighs> is cannibalism part of the ritual the children have spoken about this in almost every instance um, also uh, human feces, or drinking uh, the urine, or drinking human blood. That's part of the ritual. Right. I have a, an old three-inch scar here on my wrist where my friends used to cut my arm open and bleed my blood into a cup and drink it mixed with wine and urine four times a year as a ceremony to Satan. And finally, cremation. Most of the children describe witnessing it. It might explain why no bodies have been found. So far, police have failed to make the connection as in the case of yet another youngster who, with his mother's consent, described how bodies were disposed of. He would take the bodies and put a trash bag over the feet and head. He'd put it, and then what, we, what he would do is he had his car park, parked out back. So he took them to the funeral home, and they, got, they were cremated, and nobody ever knew anything about the bodies. These people cover the tracks very well. When they dispose of a body they use that body as well they will use as i said they will they will cremate that body they will use the ashes that will become part of what they will continue to present to that particular group and they will disperse that they're not going to do some simple murder and leave a body in a, in a stream for you to pick up the pieces of six clues that point to the illegal worship of satan each based on the testimony of children and none of it has ever been proved the problem that exists is we're getting the stories, but we, we don't have the victims. Once it's proven with one case, it's going to add more credibility to each one of the other cases. Until that one case is proved, the link between crime and satanic cults will remain speculative. The victims in this report did break the grip of Satanism, but each is left with permanent scars, and experts say they were lucky to escape. When you get into one of these groups, there's only a couple ways you can get out. One is death, the other is mental institutions, or the third, you can't get out. That's terrifying, and that's no choice. Serious business. If the police were aware of this, it might be that they could get to the instigators, to the top people. 
Why isn't there more awareness on the part of the police? Police are very reluctant to investigate these crimes as satanic crimes, Barbara, because communities quite naturally don't want their reputation stigmatized as being the home of the devil. They prefer to try to categorize them as uh, drug-related crimes, sex-related crimes, or, or robbery or something that they're more familiar with. Individual, rather than finding out who's mm -hmm. behind it. Look, if this happens to your kid, or if, if you look at this and if you have children, you say, could this happen to my child out of some kind of rebellion? How would a parent be aware? Many youngsters are into it, uh, teenagers and, and younger. Uh, and the, the clues are there, the satanic symbol, 666. If you see that written on your child's notebook, if they're into heavy metal music, if they're associating with strange characters or drifting off to ceremonies uh, and not explaining where they're at, it's well worth it for parents to look deeper and ask, what exactly are you up to? And with whom? Because this is serious. It could be harmless. It could just be a Absolutely. diversion. But it could also be deadly serious. Absolutely. Fascinating and horrifying reporter. Thank you for bringing it to us. Well, when we continue, we'll tell you about one of the biggest feuds ever to erupt in Hollywood. It involves Playboy's Hugh Hefner, a famous film director, and a murdered Playboy Playmate of the Year. Geraldo Rivera with a story of smear and obsession right after this. 2020. Sponsored by BMW. Hugh Hefner made her a pinup. Peter Bogdanovich tried to make her a star. Now each claims the other shares the blame for Dorothy Stratton's death. Geraldo Rivera with a story of smear and obsession when 2020 continues. Thirty-two years ago, Hugh Hefner founded Playboy magazine and began labeling different young women as playmates. In 1980, one of those women, Dorothy Stratton, was murdered by her estranged husband. In an age when today's news stories become tomorrow's movies, the murder of a pinup girl was guaranteed box office. What wasn't expected was that Stratton's lover, film director Peter Bogdanovich, would write a book charging that Hugh Hefner was indirectly responsible for Stratton's death. Well, since her murder, two movies have been made about Stratton, both portraying her as a sincere but gullible small-town girl, her fate sealed when she mixed with the playboy culture. Sound like the stuff of old-time Hollywood? It doesn't amuse Hugh Hefner. Geraldo Rivera has been following this story and has worked to separate reality from fantasy. Uh, um, I'm sure that this has been many a girl's dream and certainly many of the playmates dream and it's been mine dorothy strat um, age 20 like here being named playboy's playmate for the year 1980 beautiful sensual on this sunny afternoon at the peak of her promising career and to Hef, who has made me probably the happiest girl in the world today thank you with several movie roles already to her credit Dorothy represented something very special to Playboy magazine and to its founder, Hugh Hefner. She was the first of the centerfolds to have a real chance for Hollywood stardom. Some people even thought she had a chance to become another Marilyn Monroe. The tendencies to compare Dorothy with Monroe is sadly related to the way she died. Just four months after her afternoon in the Hollywood sun, Dorothy was shot and killed by the man in the white suit her estranged husband, Paul Snyder. Snyder was a former pimp and small-time promoter, and Dorothy was his basic meal ticket. She has definitely got her head together, very much so. After shooting and killing her, Snyder saved the state the trouble and turned the gun on himself. Why did he kill Dorothy? Well, for one thing, at the time of the murder, she was living with another man, Peter Bogdanovich, the well-known director and Hollywood playboy. In fact, Bogdanovich had just directed Dorothy in a film called they all laugh. All about extramarital affairs. It was art imitating life. You think she's going to meet the boyfriend or the husband or what? Find out from Moscow. This town is a place where life and death are often played out in public, and the audience has followed the tragic story of Dorothy Stratton with grim fascination. Brutally murdered by her insanely jealous husband five years ago, the young and beautiful actress and Playboy playmate is, if anything, more famous today than she ever was during her life. The reason. A bitter war is being fought by two famous men who in very different ways both loved her. It's a battle to fix the blame for her death. 
Although the Stratton murder seems a clear example of the tragic classic, jealous husband killing unfaithful wife, the only surviving member of the love triangle, the boyfriend Peter Bogdanovich, last year wrote a book in which he promoted a unique theory. It wasn't her affair that drove the husband Paul Snyder to commit murder. What really made him do it, according to Bogdanovich, was Dorothy's association with Playboy and with Hugh Hefner. I don't know that I would say that Hefner is the real villain, um, but certainly his, he's culpable for many of the things that happened um, to Dorothy. Um, I think it's, in a strange way, I think it's the whole Playboy influence. Bogdanovich refused to appear on 2020 to explain how Playboy's influence could have led to the murder. But since he began promoting his book and his views, he seems to have been on virtually every television talk show that would listen. If there was an overriding uh, desire, it was uh, to write a book which uh, would maybe help other young women to avoid some of the traps that she fell into. A person that I was very much in love with named Dorothy Stratton, who at a young age was maneuvered, tricked, uh, cajoled, coaxed. Dorothy's instincts were against it, and for six months she didn't want to do it, and fought against the idea of taking off her clothes for Playboy. Last month, in a news conference jammed by dozens of reporters, Hefner and Playboy struck back. Dorothy's tragic death was motivated, not in any way, by her association with Playboy, but clearly by the breakup of her marriage because of the affair with Peter Bogdanovich. So the famous publisher and the well-known director are engaged in a public tug of war over Dorothy Stratton's memory. And the intensity of their battle has been surprising even in this community, grown accustomed to scandal. What he has really done is, in a very delusional and obs obsessive way, is, is blame others, primarily myself, but blame others for things that he himself feels guilty about, can't deal with. And in the book, the primary villain in the book is not the husband who killed her. The, the, the villain winds up being me. I'd be a pretty good writer if I could make all that up. It's all true. And no matter what Hafner says, it all happened. Um, the stories that are in there were told to me by Dorothy or by other witnesses to the events. Conversations that I had with Hefner happened between Hefner and me. Uh, he doesn't have a very good memory. And um, unfortunately, I do. Because Bogdanovich and Hefner are who they are, each can command media attention. They can get publicity for their charges. But who's right? Let's take them one at a time. Bogdanovich has put his indictment of Hefner in writing. Our investigation reveals that in many ways, this book is a smear. Its two main points are that Dorothy was hurt by Playboy and that the association created a foul climate which led to her death. There is no real proof of either charge. And there are errors of fact and misleading innuendo ranging from serious to silly. In his very first sentence, for instance, Bogdanovich writes that Dorothy's husband, Paul Snyder, was 28. He was really 29. Bogdanovich describes how he was swept off his feet by the sight of Dorothy at this roller skating party at the mansion, which Playboy videotaped. There she was, he writes, over six feet tall, in her orange roller skates, wearing a lime green one-piece bathing suit. A one-piece bathing suit. Well, at least he got the color right. In graphic, some might say pornographic detail, he describes Snyder's violent rape and sodomy of Dorothy before or after her murder, tearing her body apart. Well, a spokesman for the coroner's office told us, quote, Bogdanovich doesn't know what he's talking about. And that, quote, there was no evidence of rape or sodomy. When asked about the apparent inconsistency, Bogdanovich in a letter says his information came from an LAPD detective. The detective now refuses to comment on the case. What I came to realize over the period that I was doing research on the book was how extraordinarily insidious this whole business of homogenized pornography had become to the point where it had gained this extraordinary amount of respectability, and Hefner was as much a tradition, Playboy and Hefner, and his whole bag of tricks was as much a tradition as Disneyland. In attempting to place blame on Hefner for Dorothy's death, Bogdanovich has made the point repeatedly that Playboy is destructively pornographic. Apparently, he's come by that feeling recently. Through 1980, Bogdanovich had been a frequent guest 
a fixture even at the Playboy Mansion. Quite at home with the man and the environment he now finds so repulsive. Look at this log of the director's many visits into the world of Playboy. Compiled by the mansion staff, it shows disco parties, holiday celebrations, Hefner's birthday, you name it, Bogdanovich was there. She uh, was naive in many ways, very innocent, believed what people said, believed the whole Playboy hype, found herself, when she got to Hollywood, found herself maneuvered by Hefner into a sexual situation that uh, she found very shocking and in fact it traumatized her. Dorothy and I talked about Hefner a lot uh, and uh, as I say she uh, spoke of him only in glowing terms. For about a year Dr. Steve Kushner shared a house with Dorothy and husband Paul Snyder. Kushner has a much different recollection of Dorothy's feelings for Hefner. Dorothy was very proud of her association with Playboy. When she became a centerfold, she was proud of that. And I think that she uh, was beside herself with joy when she became Playmate of the Year. Well, Snyder is the great, the, the, the biggest villain because he killed her. Hefner didn't kill her. I very much feel that, the, that what the book says is that we live in a climate that produces this kind of event. The climate. To housemate Kushner, it was a simple, tragic love triangle. You see it as Snyder versus Bogdanovich over Bogdanovich taking away Snyder's wife. That, that's right. Uh, you know, the uh, classic, the traditional, the tragic triangle. Right, right. It was that, and uh, you know, anyone, anyone who was close to Snyder at the time, I, I'm sure would 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 tell you the same story. Uh, uh, it was an obsession with him, and. Uh, it had nothing to do with uh, any ill will or ill feeling toward Hefner or, or Playboy. For a life so tragically shortened, Dorothy Stratton's has been very well documented. It's been the subject of two movies, a book and dozens of articles, which, if any of them contain the real story, well, probably none of them, but the real story. At least Dorothy's own version of it does exist, and it's right here, in the files of the federal courthouse in Los Angeles. It's Dorothy's autobiography. A copy was filed after her death in a court fight over who would get the rights to it. Written in 1978 at Paul Snyder's suggestion, it chronicles her first days as a playmate. Well, Bogdanovich quotes from Dorothy's writings in his book and uses them to help prove his thesis that Dorothy was pressured and unhappy in the world of Playboy. Example, on page 30, quote, And I was getting confused, dot, dot, dot. I was getting lonely and I was getting depressed, end quote. Pretty clear cut, right? She hated Playboy life wrong here's what she really said quote and i was getting confused i was living a wonderful life in the warm sunshine being catered to 24 hours a day butlers to feed me and maids to clean my room i could have anything i wanted and more and i enjoyed it so much and i started getting mixed up because i wanted paul and i was getting lonely and i was getting depressed end quote so dorothy's real complaint at the time was not having her husband paul snyder around to enjoy her good life in a letter, Bogdanovich admitted he was, quote, interpreting the meaning of Dorothy's text. Another view is that he altered the meaning to support his indictment of Hefner. He also writes that Dorothy cried during the first of these nude photo sessions with Playboy photographer Mario Caselli. A little shrug. Well, of that first session, she writes, I was a little shy standing stark naked in front of a stranger, but after a while, I became more relaxed. A little wine always helps. And got into it. I could even say it was fun. That's it. Nice. Fine. And she didn't just write about it. Listen to this Playboy interview. I love working with the camera. I enjoy working in stills or in motion pictures. I feel very natural with the camera. I, I treat it as another person. And probably because it's Mario, I have so much fun also. Did you see, as Peter Bogdanovich alleges in his book, Dorothy crying during her first nude photo session. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Did she feel she was doing something against her will? No, she totally enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, she didn't think she came up to Playboy standards. And she was surprised to even be accepted, and she was just delighted when she was accepted. To Hefner, the single most malicious charge made by Bogdanovich was that Hefner forced Dorothy to have sex with him, seducing her in the mansion's infamous jacuzzi. Did Hefner seduce her? Yes, he did. 
No, I, against your will, I, 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 I hasten to add. Did you love Dorothy? Yes, yes, yes. Not in a romantic sense, but yes, in, in a very real way. Yes. For the record, did you seduce her? No, I didn't and, and never tried to. The only person used by Bogdanovich to support even indirectly the charge of seduction has since signed a sworn declaration for Playboy that he never said Hefner forced his attentions on her or vied for Dorothy's sexual favor. It's a very real pleasure to be here. Hugh Hefner has been a fixture on America's cultural landscape now for the last 30 years, and he's always been an easy target. His magazine, its treatment of women, his offbeat lifestyle here at the mansion, and so forth. But when it gets right down to it, with Hefner, what you see is what you get. You may not like him, his magazine, or his philosophy, but he has been consistent. And contrary to Peter Bogdanovich's charges, in his treatment of Dorothy Stratton, Hefner appears to have acted totally above board. That is not to suggest that he's completely without blame in the present controversy. As a matter of fact, for a man as worldly as he is, he appears to have made a surprisingly clumsy mistake. Hours. Stung by Bogdanovich's charges, Hefner assembled this crush of reporters in Los Angeles last month and accused Bogdanovich of carrying on an affair after the murder with Dorothy Stratton's younger sister, Louise. Louise at the time was just 13 years old. So Hefner essentially was accusing Bogdanovich of child molestation. By the seduction of her 13-year-old sister and the establishment of a romantic relationship as a pathological replacement of Dorothy. Last year, an LAPD investigation concluded there was no evidence Bogdanovich did anything illegal in Los Angeles. Hefner knew that, but by last month, he was ready to hit back. This is my first public appearance since uh, suffering a stroke three and a half weeks ago. A stroke, Hefner says, was caused by the stress and the frustration generated by Bogdanovich's book. But in his efforts to get back at Bogdanovich, Hefner had wounded a child. Living in Vancouver, Canada, where she and sister Dorothy had been raised, Louise, now 17, has filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit against you, Hefner. Were Hefner's charges true? Are they true? No, not at all. They're false. You never had a sexual relationship with Peter Bogdanovich? No. L.B., why don't you describe your relationship with Peter Bogdanovich? Just a friend. He just always helped me in family matters to do with my sister because my mom can't deal with it. Why are you doing this interview? Is it to convince your friends that what you're saying is true, or is it something more than that? It's that and also to let him, you have to know that not to do this to any more people and just to, to leave me alone because I haven't done anything wrong at all. Advised by his attorneys not to talk about Louise or her lawsuit, Hefner would say this. In retrospect, do you think you overreacted? Oh, without question, sure. I would say that, that that's clear. Did you expect it to get as nasty as it's gotten? No. No. Dorothy Stratton's professional career, from promising start to sorrowful finish, lasted little more than two years. Because she touched the lives of proud, hurt, volatile men, the aftermath, the acrimony, the smears, and the obsession will last much longer. Haroldo, Peter Bogdanovich has a hit film now, Mask, starring Cher. Why doesn't he just relax and enjoy his life instead of raking up this material which might be better left unsaid. Well, even in the hit film, even in Cher's movie, uh, he's generated a huge controversy over it and Cher says it's because Peter Bogdanovich cannot accept responsibility for things that are his fault. Uh, and perhaps there's a parallel. Perhaps uh, he's projecting guilt on Hefner because he will not accept it, his own blame for being involved in this love triangle mm -hmm. and perhaps indirectly uh, doing things that led to the death of the woman he loved. I mean, maybe it's just that. He just can't accept responsibility. It sounds like a story out of Playboy, doesn't it? Well, it could be. How is Hugh Hefner? Uh, he did have a stroke, as you pointed out in the piece. How's he feeling? He looks okay. Well, you know, the Western world's most famous Playboy is confronting the fact that he will soon be 60 years old. Hard and to having had the stroke and involved in this terribly frustrating and bitter controversy, he is showing the effects of it. He's reassessing his life. Maybe he's becoming more mellow. Thank you, Harada. We'll be right back.
You know, our whole program this evening reminds us that there are depressing issues and events in the world that have to be reported on from time to time, and we report on them. I was thinking that, you know, in that feud between Bogdanovich and Hefner, uh -huh. it was a silly and bitter feud, but it's not about those two men. I, I think it has its roots in the exploitation of women. And when is that going to stop? Well, it's been around for almost since the beginning of time. It will stop when both men and women want it to stop. That's true, but uh, I, I can't quite put it equal in my mind since in a male-dominated society, the blame for bullying has to go in one, one place. And well, I, we can argue. I, 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 yes, you are right, but <laughs> anyway. uh, well, we could, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do this all year. We'll come back. Right. Well, the thing on Satanism, that's a singularly repulsive uh, fact, and it may be very widespread, as, as Tom reported. I just don't like to accept the idea that that's the tone of America, you know, or that America is coming apart. There are positive things in, in our there certainly, I mean, when we, when Tom and I were talking, we said, look, well, are there warning signs if, if this happens to your child, especially to teenagers? And, and you do have to be aware, but this is also the time of the year when really so many are rejoicing over kids graduating from high school yeah. and college. It's the health of the country and the health of young people. I think that that's an important thing to stress. And we can, I know we've mentioned this before, but talking about children, you know, three weeks ago, you saw when we, we had a special program on New York City school children who raised a quarter of a million dollars for the starving in Ethiopia and the impact of what they did and our and the impact of our broadcast I think has been has been quite high. The relief group that they worked through, the Save the Children uh, Foundation, has received over a million dollars in contributions, and all over the country there are other groups now. Um, a starting organization. Absolutely, I love the challenge of that one New York City kid. Challenge. Challenging other schools to raise more than we did yeah, and yeah, wanting them to. You show know. Us. Now, yeah. now there are chapters in Connecticut tomorrow. There's one beginning. Los Angeles has one. Florida has a chapter. Not chapters, but kids doing it in school. Starting up, yeah. yeah. And in Minneapolis, Dallas, Washington, D.C., uh, Buffalo, all. Uh, it's beginning to snowball. Good I'm news sure. sometimes does spread. Sometimes good news is the real news. So the spirit of the New York kids is spreading. And uh, you remember the song, We Are the World, that was made famous by a great group of artists. Well, the kids in New York sang it, and we're going to listen to them sing a little of that once more. Aren't they something? Well, now, with a word about tonight's nightline, here is Ted Koppel. Ted? Hugh, we're going to focus tonight on those recent charges that the CIA was involved with counter-terrorists who killed innocent people in Beirut. The issue is whether there is any right way for a democracy to deal with terrorism, and our guests include Jesse Jackson. That's nightline following your local news. And that's 2020 for tonight. We're in touch, so you be in touch. I'm Hugh Down. And I'm Barbara Walters. And for all of us at 2020, good night. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, President Duarte of El Salvador talks about his meeting with President Reagan. Also, Duran Duran and the great Catherine Hepburn. Next week, Phil Collins and Tina Turner on Good Morning America. Saturday, bank bandits lead Hooker on a high-speed chase with tragic results on T.J. Hooker. Then Lee Majors, Linda Evans, and John Forsythe take a special two-hour cruise to China aboard the love boat. Later tonight, learn the facts behind the frightening statistics of battered women on a special edition of Eye on Hollywood. Transcript of tonight's broadcast, send $3 to Journal Graphics, Box 2020, and Sonia Station, New York, New York, 10023. This has been the ABC News Magazine, 2020. Don't drink and drive. A public service message.